Okay. The recording is started. 30, 31 years old. Alvaro is going to do the second lecture on computational number theory. All right. Thank you. Um, so here, here we are. Second lecture. Uh, today, what we're going to do is do a bunch of Sage. So Sage Math is a free open source um, uh, software in mathematics uh, that um, it has a lot of functionality of its own, and then it also builds on other open source packages. So you call you can call in uh, other packages that you might uh, have used separately, like Maxima, Gap, R. And um, if you know Python, the language under the um, hood of sage i said uh well um is python so if you know python then uh, some of the commands will make more sense and uh the the package is built as a free open source alternative to uh, maple mathematica matlab and magma um which uh, some of those uh maybe you you started using earlier on such as mathematica and this is all free so as I said last time, um, you can download it, and I have uh, here I have open a version that is uh, local, and you can also use CoCalc. I'm going to try to use CoCalc today. If um, if for whatever reason the connection is not good, I'll, I'll change to my local version, and that's what I usually do, or have a local version in my PC at home. Uh, there is a video already up on on this on Sage Math. So if you go to um, to the uh, resources for this course on the CTNT website. If you go to the YouTube playlist of lectures, I made a video on Sage Math already, which is available, and uh, that covers a few basics. So today I'm going to do a little bit uh, something different uh, than in that video. So uh, because there are several courses. So oh, by the way, so this is my in my account for uh, for CoCalc. This is what it looks like once you've opened a C, uh, Sage. Uh, worksheet. And uh, so what I'm going to do is, since there are a few other, uh, there are four other courses running uh, simultaneously in CTNT, what I'm going to do is uh, look at uh, what other people have done in the courses and try to do those things myself on, on Sage. By the way, I, I'm not looking at the screen with the chat and all that, so uh, Brandon will let me know. If you have questions, please, by all means, let me know. Uh, and uh, uh, I, just to, to make it more interactive. All right, so let's uh, let's start with some basics. That's how you do addition. Uh, you can do GCDs on Sage. So for example, the GCD of three and six, that's three. Uh, you can do something like X GCD. Uh, what is that? So let's see what happens if I do the X GCD of three and seven. It gives me a tuple, which is uh, it's a solution to a Bazoo equation. So what that means is trying to solve the equation, uh, the GCD of three and seven, which is one, equals minus uh, uh, a x plus b y. So here, uh, so it's trying to solve one equals three x plus seven y. So uh, what it's saying is that one is two times or minus two times three plus uh, one times seven, All right? So yeah, that's true. So that, that's what that GCD is doing for you. Is there right. an XKCD command? <laughs> no, there is not XKCD, but it's very close. All right, so um, we can do modular arithmetic. So if I want to know how much is uh, 16 modulo seven, I can do it like that. Uh, but I can also call, uh, be a little bit, bit more sophisticated and call the integers uh, mod seven, and then uh, do arithmetic with the integers mod seven. So if I wanted to know how much is 16 mod seven, then I can say, okay, within R, what's 16? What's the class of 16? This, uh, the class is two. All right. Uh, we can also do, um, in basic number theory, we can do the Chinese remainder theorem. So if I do the Chinese remainder theorem, so what does this look like? Uh, so that is the problem. What is an X that is one mod five and uh, two mod seven? Um, so um, so what, what, what would that be? That would be 16. So 16, uh, if you want, you can uh, check the solution. So 16 mod five should be one and 
uh, 16 mod 7 should be 2, 1 and 2. By the way, every time you want to evaluate a command here, uh, you do uh, shift enter. What else can we do? We can do uh, some um, arithmetic functions. So by the way, if you want to uh, do comments in your worksheet, uh, so you can say arithmetic functions, and that uh, that's just a comment and uh, Sage will uh, forget about it. So, okay, so I can do, for example, the uh, Euler fee function and the Euler fee function is of 100, it's 40. So uh, if I try Euler theorem um, modulo 100, 3 to the 40 should be 1. Very good. I can write uh, like in uh, uh, in Brendan's course on sieves, um, he talked about the sigma function. So here is the sigma function 10 to is 130. What does that mean? Let's check that's true. Uh, those are the divisors of 10 to the square power. So it's the sum of the divisors of 10 to the square power. Uh, so that should be 130. That's correct. All right, very good. Uh, we are number theorists, so we like to talk about primes. So what, the primes are uh, under this uh, command. That's the set of all prime numbers. And if I call it something, so I'm going to uh, fix that. I'm going to call it P, and then I can call the first prime number. Weirdly, the first prime number is the zeroth prime number in, in Sage, again, because this is built on uh, Python and in Python, the lists, the first element of a list is the zeroth element. So that's P zero. Okay. And then I can call P2 is five. So P2 is actually the third prime number. So you have to remember that, that kind of, that if you don't keep that in mind, that might, uh, you know, that, that, that might, if you don't remember what's the order in your list, you might get confused by one. All right, let's do some sieves. Sieves. Okay, so um, what can we do in terms of sieves? The first thing that uh, one knows how to do a sieve, which is what Brandon explained in his first lecture, is the sieve of our uh, Eratosthenes. So uh, the sieve of Eratosthenes, uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to do a list of integers. So the integer i for i in a range from 2 to 100, which, by the way, that means is the number from 2 to 99. And uh, for each one of those numbers, I'm going to uh, sieve them by saying I want those numbers whose GCD with 2 is 1. So I'm only uh, I'm doing the sieve that uh, you start with the sieve of Ratosinis and only keep the odd numbers. Uh, OK. Uh, I think, or did it do wrong? Um, uh, maybe um, invalid syntax in range uh, or I in range. Okay, there you go. All right. So here is the odd numbers, right? Uh, and I can uh, modify that if I want to see numbers that are odd and not divisible by three. I can uh, do that, and now I get all the numbers up to 99, which are not divisible or relatively prime to six. And you can keep going like that, and times of uh, times five and times seven would give me all these numbers. That since the square root of 100 is 10, and I've sieved out the multiples of uh, the primes up to the square root. Uh, like below the, the square root of um, of 100, then these are all prime numbers. So 2, 3, 5, and 7, and all these are the primes below uh, 100. So that's a C for you. Uh, it also came up in my, uh, in my lecture that we were talking about um, prime conductors, elliptic curves of prime conductor, and we wanted to know how many primes are there below uh, 500,000. Well, uh, let's see, that's the prime counting function is prime pi, and prime pi will tell you exactly what you want. 
So here is uh, 500,000. And let's see, there is 41,538 primes below, below 500,000. Okay. Um, and please, uh, Brandon, let me know if there are any questions. Um, what can I do with that? I can also, uh, let's look at what the prime counting function looks like. So I'm going to plot uh, the prime counting function. So for that, I'm going to plot points and each point is going to be i comma uh, each point is i comma prime pi of i okay and uh for and what range for i in range uh let's say from 2 to uh, 50 for now let's see what that looks like there you go the prime counting function is a step function because i'm until it doesn't encounter another prime, it doesn't increase in value. So you get uh, this uh, step ladder of, uh, of a function. However, if you start increasing the, uh, the range, it starts to look a little more smooth. So here is up to 100, here is up to 1,000. Oh, and now it's starting to look like something. It's just a, a little bit jittery, but it looks like a curve. Uh, and then up to 10,000. Uh, let's uh, let's wait for Sage to do this for us. It looks yeah, I can still see myself uh, the jitters, but it's starting to look like something. All right. So uh, how about um, let, let's try to uh, let's see what the prime number theory tells us. So the prime number theory, the prime number theorem says that asymptotically, this function is, it looks like uh, x uh, log x. Uh, so I'm going to plot x over log x in the range, the same range up to 10,000 uh, points. Let's see what happens. You're dividing by log one. Why are you showing it? Log, no, I'm, I'm dividing by log x. It's uh, the plot of x log x. Can you not see that? The, is the writing too small? I can see. It looks like you're starting at 1, where log 1 isn't defined, but OK. Oh, oh, oh let, yeah. Let's start at 2. Just didn't give any problems, but uh, you're right. I see. I see what you meant. OK, so uh, so here you go. But if you are, if you haven't, I guess yet seen all the lectures by Brandon, uh, you might think like, wait, 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 wait a second, x log x, it seems like they are diverging. I thought x log x was a good approximation of, uh, of the prime counting function. And that is not what the prime number theory, theorem says. They said they are asymptotic, that the quotient of one by the other goes to one, the quotient, not the, uh, the difference. So that you see that the difference is uh, there is an error, and the error is growing, and in fact, the uh, the size of that error is actually the content of the uh, the Riemann hypothesis in one way, uh, just bounding how big is that error is a way to rephrase the uh, the Riemann hypothesis. So this the difference between one and the other is something very important in number theory. Uh, let's by the way, I can change the color of the graph so you can see it perhaps a little better a little better by the way i will post the um the sage code for all this that i'm doing i'll post it later okay so as i said we do not want to look at this graph this is nice but it is telling you that yeah you're going to get a lot of error if you use one or the other um in one of the exercises what i'll uh I'll uh, ask you is to do the same thing I'm doing, but with a logarithmic integral, which is a better approximation. It's still not going to be exactly the same function, but it's a better approximation. The error is a little tighter. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll have you do the same kind of thing, but with the logarithmic integral. Let's, uh, let's do better than this is if I am going to compare uh, the function to uh not not that well let's let's look at actually at what the difference is first of all so if i plot that and it's the prime counting function minus the, what's supposedly an approximation 
uh, x over log x and let's see what that error looks like. All right, so, um, so here you go. So the error now it looks very jittery, but you see now the error in uh, up to 10,000, like what the error looks like and it's growing. And um, so um, I, I've, um, Keith is sending me a message on the sidelines that uh, the Riemann hypothesis is really the, uh, the, is the bound with the logarithmic integral, not with this one, but um, but in any case, so that the difference uh, is related to the to the Riemann hypothesis in one way, and um, okay. So now instead of doing that, what I want to the, the, with the uh, prime number theorem theorem actually says is something about the quotient of the two. Where am I uh, here? So let's do um, instead of this one, I'm going to now plot. Uh, the quotient of the two functions. So uh, let's see if this works. Uh, one by the other. Let's plot that one instead. All right. So here is the the quotient, and you see that graph is actually supposed to go to one. It's uh, hard to tell. Hard to tell that it's actually going to one. You might want to extend the range of that function to actually see if the limit is actually approaching one. Uh, you can also just, uh, for uh, frame of reference, I'm going to plot uh, the function one uh, in uh, in RGB color uh, one. Just so you see how far are we from one. So uh, the error starts about uh, 1.2 and it looks like it's decreasing towards one, uh, but um, it's, not, it's not quite clear from the data. So the data here can help you, but you actually need to prove a theorem to prove that that limit is actually one. And that is the prime number theorem. All right. Um, you might want to do this for other functions. So in the uh, in the, one of the exercises that I will post a little bit later is also about this, but do the prime counting function. Instead of the prime counting function, I want you to count primes that are in a congruence class. The, um, the uh, Dirichlet's uh, theorem on arithmetic progressions uh, tells you that there are infinitely many primes in the, in the class of A modulo N if A and N are relatively prime. So, for example, there are infinitely many primes that are 1 mod 5. So, we can try to count how many primes that are 1 mod 5 are there and then do uh, a, 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 num a prime number theorem uh, for those uh, for that class of primes. And that is known what the value is. And you can try to investigate it with the graph of see what value you get towards. But the, for that, we're going to need to define our own prime counting function. So let me show you how to define a function. So I'm going to define a function that is, um, is Sophie. So this uh, function is just going to check if a prime is uh, Sophie Germain prime. So here's how you define such a function. Uh, we're going to say if P is prime uh, is not true, first of all. So I'm going to check if P is not prime, then it is definitely not a Sophie Germain prime. So error. Um, let's go. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, there was just a little hiccup. You're fine. Okay, good. So uh, first of all, I'm checking in the function that if uh, I have a Sophie Germain prime, the prime itself, the number itself should be a prime. So if it is not, then it's going to yell at you. Oh, come on. Uh, this number is not even prime. Okay. And then what? And then uh, if, uh, if it is prime, so if it is prime, then I'm going to check 2p plus 1 uh, and if this one is prime. And if this one is prime, then I'm going to print uh, that uh, p and uh, is uh, Sophie 
your main prime smiley face uh, because uh, because and then uh, 2p plus 1 is also prime. Well done. Okay, and that's uh, that's my function, and now I can uh, evaluate it, and now it's in memory, and then I can uh, I can try it out. So is Sophie uh, the number six, and then it's a very sassy function, and it tells you, uh, nope, that number is not even prime. Uh, is uh, okay, let's try again. So is uh, uh, is uh, is three? Yes. Uh, three is as a feature main prime because seven is also prime. Well done. Okay, so that's how you will define a function. By the way, you can uh, something that I didn't put here. This is just uh, uh, doing some printing on the screen. The function is just uh, printing, um, and uh, and um, what was I going to say? Yeah. Oh, that you can you can write uh, a return, so you can return something in in there so for example i could have written that the function returns um uh, if, if this is the case return uh true and if this is the case uh, you can return false okay so that the function actually returns um some output all right so i think that's that's all i wanted to do for um, for sieves, and if there are any questions, please do let me know. Okay, so now uh, let's move on to uh, to talking about curves. All right, so uh, the another course on CTNT this year is about curves over finite fields. So I'm going to uh, work over. Uh, on curves over uh, over finite fields now. Uh, you define finite fields by the command gf. So gf5 is the finite field of size 5. Why is it not ff5? It's because finite fields are actually uh, sometimes called Galois fields um, because Galois started uh, a systematic study of finite fields. All right. so. Um, Let's define, uh, first of all, if we're going to talk about curves and need an affine space um, of uh, over my finite field, GF5, what? GF5, and I have to tell it the dimension, and the X and the Y are the affine coordinates for my space, okay? And then I can define a curve over that finite field. I'm going to define a uh, hyperbola, so a conic like this over A, and then let's look at it. Uh, there you go. All right. Um, then other things that I can do is uh, interesting on finite fields is that I can count points. So there are algorithms uh, to uh, to do count of points. And uh, here, the, the sage commands, you, you saw they, ha they all have these parentheses because that's where you would put in uh, parameters. So here, actually, you need a parameter. You need to say one if you want to count the points over the base field. So that tells me that there are four points over the uh, finite field of size five. So we can actually look at them, the rational points, rational means f5 rational uh, those are the points there you go you have four but if i instead do count of points uh two then it actually returns a vector or a, a tuple uh, with four and 24 24 means that are uh, 24 points over the uh, unique degree two extension of f5 so it's telling me that there are 24 points over f25 right so if I went back and I defined the curve over 25 and did one, then it would give me the number of points modulo uh, or not modulo over the field of 25 elements. All right. Uh, we can, when we have curves, we can check that they are smooth over the base field. Um, 
uh, yes, it is smooth. And uh, I can also, <clears throat> this was an affine uh, curve, that you remember? Uh, I can make it projective. So I can look at the projective, uh, uh, projective closure of my curve. And it gives me some projective closure. You might want to actually fix yourself what are your uh, projective coordinates. So let's start uh, a projective space ourselves like this and then uh, this is going to be projective space still over uh, the field of five elements two-dimensional this is a projective plane and i'm going to uh, define the uh, curve which is the projectivization of my uh, of my curve in projective space, that's the ambient, uh, the ambient space, and I can call it. And now it's giving me the uh, that um, finite field and the curve in projective coordinates. Now I can do the count again. And if I count points, now it tells me there are six points. What happened? Uh, there used to be four points. That means that in the affine chart, I picked here, there were four points, but there must be two more points at infinity. So let's have a look. Uh, what are the rational points now? Rational meaning rational with uh, projective coordinates. And then you see that uh, the ones with a one there are the in the affine chart we had picked before. There are two new points, one, one, zero and four, one, zero are points that are uh, up in the um, up in the uh, infinity. All right. We can talk also about uh, elliptic curves that Somia did. So uh, very interesting would be to define elliptic, whoops, elliptic curves over a finite field. So um, by the way, uh, there is a lot of documentation on, uh, on elliptic curves for finite fields in the reference manual, and I will drop a link also in the in the Sage worksheet that I have for you later. Um, but here is how you would define uh, an elliptic curve. Curve. Oh, by the way, if you do tab uh, and Sage, it will give you what options you have at this point with all that. Uh, you've you've typed, so I'm going to complete it to elliptic curve, and then I would give the value stress coefficients of my elliptic curve, um, but I want them to be in GF5. So it suffices if I fixed one of the coefficients is in GF5, then it knows to uh, to complete it uh, so that all the coefficients are in GF5. So that elliptic curve is that elliptic curve over the finite field of size five. Had I typed just one, two, three, four, six, that would have been an elliptic curve over Q. All right. Um, another way to do the same thing is that I can, uh, instead of doing that, I can specify for Sage uh, what the field of definition is first and then give the uh, value stress coefficients. And then it would also return the same elliptic curve. Uh, a weird feature is that I can plot elliptic curves, so I can plot them in the affine space. So here is a weird plot of an elliptic curve. Maybe if we go back and uh, look at this elliptic curve modulo, or not in the in the field with 125 elements instead, maybe that will give me something more uh, exotic. Oops, what happened? Not implemented. I thought I had done this before. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, or maybe okay. Let let's try. How about in a field that is a, a prime, uh, a prime field? All right. So over the field of uh, thirty-seven elements. Uh, I can do a plot of an elliptic curve in the affine space over the finite field of size 37, and then you get a plot like that. Um, it's funky. All right. So uh, what about 
Uh, let's go back to uh, an elliptic curve uh, uh, over GF5. So I'm going to go back to this one uh, right here. And I'm going to look at the rational points. So let's see, I can still count points for, uh, does that mean projective or uh, affine? Well, it actually, uh, I can do just points uh, on the elliptic curve. And then you see that the point at infinity is also there. There is only one point at infinity in budget stress form. So it actually is counting all of the points. So there are four points overall. I can also look at the structure. There are four points. I know that this is an abelian group. Uh, so I can actually look at, uh, if I look at E abelian group, it returns uh, the points as an abelian group. So it now uh, considers hey, this. Alvaro, there's yep. a question. Yep. Uh, Steve, Steve was asking if GF five comma three would work instead of GF 125. GF of 5, comma 3. Let's do for the plotting. I think so. Like that. Hmm. I'm not sure what GF of 5, comma 3 does, though. It still defines it as a finite field of size 5. So I'm not sure what. The three adds to the to the command uh, finite field. So I'm I'm not sure. It's still thinking that it's a uh, an elliptic curve over a five. So I'm not sure. All right, let's go back here. And uh, what I was saying is that you can grab uh, out of the rational points or the F five rational points. These are just the points, but we know it forms an abelian group. There are four points, and I would like to know. Is it Z mod 2 cross Z mod 2 or Z mod 4? Is it cyclic or not? I can grab the abelian group and it automatically tells me that it's Z4, uh, Z mod 4, so it is cyclic. Okay, I can, um, I can uh, do something like this. So I can actually call it, let's, uh, let's call it G, and then I can call the generators of my group. Um, oops, I didn't define it. Shift enter. Shift enter, and it tells me the generator. So let's call that point, that generator, the zeroth element in that list. That's my generator, and then I can uh, call it. Okay, I can add it to itself, right? I can multiply by three, right, uh, and times four, and I get that uh, four times P is the point at infinity, which is my zero element. So it is a point of order four. So this is a generator of the uh, cyclic group. Uh, let's try again, uh, something like this, but now I'm going to do it again over uh, the field with 37 elements. So now there are 39 points. And um, so is this, uh, is this cyclic, is, what, what is this? So, um, so, well, it should be, so it's a billion, uh, the billion group of E, and then you can see that is uh, Z mod 39. All right, so, um, and I already did a plot of that. Um, Somia also talked about the Frobenius, so I can ask, Sage to compute the Frobenius element. And uh, thank you, Sage. Phi is the Frobenius element. And, uh, but then I can ask things about the Frobenius element. So uh, I can, uh, let's, let's first ask, what is the trace of uh, Frobenius for this elliptic curve? Um, modulo 37, the trace is minus one. So they can, I can actually put together the, the Frobenius, uh, the minimal polynomial of the action of Frobenius, which Shomia talked about, uh, but that I can actually get right away from the uh, from Sage. Here's the minimal polynomial, uh, like uh, Shomia described it in class. Um, what else can I do? I think I can call the J invariant of my elliptic curve, the J invariant is 35. I can also ask Sage if this, uh, if this is a super singular or ordinary elliptic curve. Uh, it is not super singular. And I can also 
uh, call for isogenies. Uh, are there isogenies? Isogenies of prime degree. Let's see. Uh, well, um, how many elements are there in I? By the way, if you want to know what is the length of a, of a vector, uh, that's uh, len uh, as in Python. So there are eight. There are eight isogenies of prime degree. And then what I can do is, well, let's let's see what happens if I do this. Boom. Um, it gives you a list of the isogenies. Uh, and the, each isogeny will give you uh, the elliptic curve and the target elliptic curve. And isogeny is a map between isogenies, and it gives you both the map and the target elliptic curve. So let me see what isogeny degrees are there. So for uh, every psi, and uh, in my list of isogenies, I can check what isogeny degrees are there. And it turns out there is uh, degrees 3, 7, 13, 13, 19, 19, 31, and 31. So those are the isogenies that are present. OK? All right. I think that's more or less for um, curves for the time being. I'm saving them as different Sage worksheets for each class. So I might revisit there and add more commands if there is something that comes up in the other courses that uh, that people would like to know how to do. All right, uh, let's switch gears to uh, piadic numbers. Uh, Liang's course is on piadic um, functions on ZP. So uh, let's see how to do a few things with piadics. Uh, how do I define the piadics? Uh, Liang has been working uh, with Z5, so let's see. Uh, it's ZP, so it's a, a piadic, uh, piadic integers for p equals five, and I should specify. Hold on, Alvaro, we've got another question. Yeah. Uh, give it, given two elliptic curves, can you check if they are isogenous? On yes. Before you move to the next section here. Yes, yes, yes. So let me let me grab uh, two elliptic curves. So <clears throat> I had E over the finite field of size 37. So let's pick another elliptic curve uh, E2 in the um, whoops, elliptic, elliptic uh, curve uh, in, G, in GF uh, 37. And let's pick something else, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Let's see if that's an elliptic curve to begin with. It is, and I believe I can do E is isogenous to E2, false, okay? So uh, that's how you check. Um, I believe if it is, if you happen to find, uh, so here I found all the isogenies before, so that gives you, oh, these are, those are the isogenies of prime degree, then the, you can do compositums. Uh, of uh, you can do composition of those isogenies and find all their isogenies, by the way. Um, but given that, I could have found an elliptic curve that is isogenous to E. And if I do E is isogenous, I believe it will actually report back what the isogeny is as well. Good question. Thank you. All right. So let's go, um, let's move to piadics. So here is the piadic numbers, Z5, and then I can uh, create numbers in Z5. So for example, a half is a number. There was a question in Liang's course about what is a piadic number that is not an integer? Well, a half is not an integer, but a half is a five adic number. Uh, let's look at it. And it has this expansion um, over the five addicts. Uh, let's try also defining uh, another one that is a uh, five attic integer is a third is a five attic integer. There it is. And I can add five attic integers and then I get that, uh, well, a half is three mod five, a third is two mod five. So when I add them up, it actually is zero mod five and the five attic expansion starts with five. I can add, by the way, I can do valuations that came up today on um, on Liang's course. So I can do uh, the valuation of A and the valuation is zero, but if I do the valuation of A plus B, the valuation is one because it is divisible by five, All right? Very good. 
I can uh, look at other numbers. So for example, is the square root of two a five attic integer? It turns out that this completion all of a sudden has more numbers than the integers or the rational numbers. This completion of Q, that is Q5, has more numbers. So it might be the case that some uh, algebraic numbers are actually in the base field in Q5 or even in the integers mod five. So let's define a polynomial. <clears throat> over the five hat x, and I'm going to define the polynomial x squared minus two, whoops. And uh, then I can try to check if there are roots over the five hat integers, and nope. Um, well, there are no roots because, for example, for, because of Hensel's lemma, uh, two is actually not a square mod five, so it could not possibly be that two is an integer uh, in the p hat x. Uh, in the five addicts. Uh, however, I can uh, factor all the polynomials. Well, let's look at x squared minus one. And sure, that factors, we know what the factors, what the roots are, right? Uh, that is x plus one times x minus one. So there, there better be roots. Uh, you can see the second entry is one, but the first entry, what on earth is that? That is minus one. In the five addicts minus one, the expansion, because the digits are between zero and four, the expansion is of minus one is four, 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 et cetera. Because a one and minus one are the roots of that polynomial. Hey, Albro, we've got another question here. Uh, Steve wants to know, is there a way to write the piatic numbers in the tuple format that uh, Keith talked about yesterday? In the tuple format? Um... I don't know how to do it, but um, um, I'll, I'll look it up. I, there might, it might be implemented. I don't know if, if Brandon knows or someone else that is connected knows. Uh, it might be implemented. I don't know how to do that, but also we could, we could create our, our own function. If it's not implemented, I'll, I'll put it as an exercise because the, the tuple format is, uh, for example, the tuple format of minus one would be four and then four plus this term and four plus this term plus this term and so on to find all the congruences modulo consecutive powers of five. So we could actually write a little function that gives me the tuple format if it's not implemented uh, out of the box. Thank you. Uh, let's see another rank uh, where the square root of two is in the base rank. So for example, uh, two is a square mod seven. Uh, because nine is two mod seven, so two should be there. So let's do the same thing here, but in uh, the seven addicts, um, something went wrong. Uh, oh, I didn't define the seven addicts. So let's just define the seven addicts. Thank you, Sage. Uh, so here is seven precision 20. Aha, uh -huh. and then two, is a, uh, a square in in the seven addicts and here are the two square roots so this is a, a seven addict expansion of the uh, square root of two and minus a square root of two all right um let's also look at something like um uh it's another polynomial that i can factor is that i believe also came up in Liang's course is that this polynomial over the seven addicts should completely split in the seven addicts. So let, let's look at all the, the root. Oh, by the way, maybe I can do something a little bit different this time is that I can factor the polynomial and then you can see the factors. That's quite a mess. Uh, so let's do uh, the roots instead. And now you can see the roots. And as predicted, there is a root that is one mod seven, a root that is two mod seven, a root that is three mod seven, four, five, and six mod seven. So those are all the roots. So you see that the um, the sixth roots of unity are in in the um, in the seven addicts. Okay, so those are all numbers whose sixth power is one. All righty. Uh, what else can we do? Uh, I think I'm going to move on. I think I have about uh, five minutes. Is that right, Brendan? Uh, yeah, about five minutes, maybe six. 
So let's switch to Galois theory. Uh, for now, uh, um, Keith has already started talking about with the, his classes about infinite Galois theory. He has started talking, started with an introduction to uh, basic Galois theory. So I just wanted to show you how to do basic Galois theory in Sage for now. Uh, for example, I can uh, compute, start with a cyclotomic field, and then we're going to compute a Galois group of that. So I can start with a cyclotomic field uh, of order, so the 125th cyclotomic field, and I can compute its Galois group and ask Sage, what is the Galois group? Uh, I'm going to like that. G is not defined, it's C. What is the Galois group of C? So, um, oh yeah, yeah, G is not defined, there you go. All right, so G, we define it as a Galois group, and Sage tells you uh, also a little bit sassy. Uh, well, it is the Galois group. It doesn't tell you more information, so you have to you have to dig it out. Uh, you have to pull it out of Sage if you want more information. What kind of what kind of Galois group is that? Is it cyclic? It, let's ask first. Is it a, a billion? Yes. This is like a game of like who is who. Uh, is this uh, a cyclic group? True. Okay, we'll see that in, in Magma. I, I actually don't know if maybe Sage also has it. In Magma, there is a, um, a command that is group name and it tells you exactly what the group name is. This might also be in Sage and I just don't know about it. Um, all right, so it's a cyclic group of what order? It's a, a cyclic group of order 100. And then I can pull out, so it's cyclic, so there's going to be just one generator. So I can pull the uh, the generator of G and uh, look at G. Whoa, that's a generator. So uh, the the groups are stored as symmetric uh, groups, so subgroups of symmetric groups. So this is a permutation of, or, of order 100, and it's a cyclic uh, permutation. So yes, it's a, uh, a permutation. All right, so let's uh, let's find out some uh, fixed fields. So for that, I need uh, I need the subgroup of uh, of G. So I'm going to group. They make the groups generated by G itself, and then look at what is the uh, the fixed field of that. And it tells me that is the a field with defining polynomial X. And it gives me the ring morphism also that is related to this. So if I just do zero, then it will just return the number field. It's a number field like that. Um, what what on earth is that number field? Um, well, you can just look at the degree uh, to get a little more information about it. It's degree one, so it's Q. Is the Galois group is um, uh, hello? Can you hear me? We've got a question. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, what's the question? Uh, Yazan has a question, um, but I. Oh, here we go. I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, Yazan, can you? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I was just gonna ask about. Uh, so, uh, when we're, uh, if if we have an abelian group, could we uh, ask about its? Uh, Invariant factors or elementary divisors in Sage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that. I think so. Uh, let me see if. Uh, by the way, for a, a group, I can do tab and then look at what is available to me, and I can do uh, elementary divisors. Doesn't seem to be there, and uh, uh, invariant factors. Um, I know, I know I can do that in magma. I forget what the command is in Sage. Um, let me let me look it up and I'll 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 add it to the page later. Um, I forget. I, I, I know that uh, elementary devices, I believe, uh, works. And in, in magma, 
um, but I forget how to do it in Sage. All right, so thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. Um, all right, so we found out that K is the rationals, the fixed field of the entire uh, group is just the rationals. Let's do one uh, that is a little more exciting. So if I do uh, this, uh, instead of G, I'm going to do with G is square, then what do I get? I get a field of degree two, because now uh, the element G is square, if G had element, if G had um, order 100, then G square has order 50, and I'm doing the fixed field of a group of order 50 in a subgroup of order 50 in the Galag group of order 100. So now I get a quadratic number field, and it sage gives me the quadratic polynomial that cuts out that number field. I can do the same thing for if you want, uh, like Keith asked, uh, how about a cyclic group of order uh, a cyclic group of order five? So uh, then actually this one should work, and you can get the polynomial that defines that field. Okay. Um, I can actually pick up that polynomial if you want to know more about this field. Let me just do uh, the last thing perhaps today. I'm going to go to the LMFDB and I'm going to go to uh, number fields global. I'm going to input the number field I want to know about and I can figure out a whole lot of information about that number field. but in particular, I can go back to Sage. If I copy and paste all of this information to Sage, then uh, let's see what happens. I can compile all that, and then Sage starts working hard for me and computes all the invariants that you might want to look at uh, for your number field. The signature, discriminant, ramified primes, the class group units, uh, all of it very quickly for a Quintic. It's all computed in there. That's really nice. Okay, um, perhaps uh, I'll, I'll stop here in the homework. I'll give you uh, an exercise to do um, something in, of, this, uh, of this kind with Galois groups in Sage, but in the uh, 16th or the 32nd uh, cyclotomic field and find all the quadratic fields uh, that are in there, just so you try um, you try to find all the all the quadratics in there using Sage. You can also just figure it out uh, what the quadratics are, uh, but you can use Sage to find them out too. All right, very good. So I'll stop there. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions? So you can um, uh, turn the recording off, Brendan.